Now, the overarching question of this conference is what is needed to reduce rural inequality and how we can measure its achievement. So we have two speakers who are going to share their views on this. His Excellency Eko Putro Sanjoyo, who's the Minister of Village Development of Disadvantaged Regions and Transmigration in Indonesia, and Professor Martin Revalian from Georgetown University and former director of the World Bank's Research Department. Welcome to both of you. We are delighted to have you here with us. I'm now going to pass the floor on to the moderator of the session, Paul Winters, who's the Interim Associate Vice President of the Strategy and Knowledge Department at IFAD. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, as noted, I have the, the pleasure of uh, introducing this, this first plenary session, what is needed to reduce rural inequality and how we can measure it, how we can measure its achievements. So uh, uh, we have two speakers, one a policymaker, minister from Indonesia, and then Professor Revalian, who has a long background in, in measuring poverty, inequality, and broadly uh, looking at policies linked to poverty and inequality. So let me start by introducing them. Uh, His Excellency, Excellency Eko Putro Sanjojo is Minister of Village Development of D Disadvantaged Regions and Transmigration in Indonesia. His ministry is tasked with operationalizing Indonesia's village law and implementing their village fund program to accelerate the development of Indonesian villages across the country. Prior to taking up this post in 2016, his Excellency held several high-profile senior positions in the private sector. He thus brings a unique combination of skills from his practical experience in running big private companies and working within the government. His vision for transforming the lowest administrative level into an economic force for change is very interesting and a priority for the current government. I therefore very much look forward to his presentation entitled, A New Era of Village Development in Indonesia. Then we have Professor Martin Revalian, holds the inaugural Edmund D. Villani Chair of Economics at Georgetown University. Prior to joining Georgetown University, he was the director of the World Bank's research department, where he established the Dollar Day Poverty Line, which has since been raised to 190. He has advised several governments and international agencies on poverty and policies for fighting it, and has written extensively on this and other subjects in economics, including five books, and over 200 papers in scholarly journals and edited volumes. His presentation is entitled, A Rural Perspective on Inequality, Poverty, and Politics. So each of the presentations will be about 20 minutes or so, and then we should have 20 minutes or so for, for questions at the end. Um, so think of your questions as you're listening. And so now let me uh, ask His Excellency Eko Pucho Sanjojo to the podium. Thanks. Madam Cornelia Richard, the Vice President of IFAD. Mr. Oscar Garcia, Director of Office Evaluation of IFAD, the host of this event. Mr. Professor Paul Winter, the Associate Vice President for Strategy and Knowledge Department of IFAD. Professor Martin Revalier, Excellencies, permanent representative, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I forgot my good friend Ron, which is, he is the representative of IVAT in Indonesia. He's been very helpful to me. Ron? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, it's very honor for me to sit here before you to share my experience in Indonesia. Probably some of you doesn't know much about Indonesia. Indonesia is a country with 17,000 islands. I don't think any country in the world has the 17,000 islands. We got three different time zones. Our length is equal from the east coast to the west coast of the United States. We got more than 74,954 villages all over Indonesia. Indonesia is in the tropical side of the globe and currently our GDP already exceeding, exceeding a trillion US dollar. We are number 16 in the world in terms of GDP. 
because only 16 country in the world who got GDP more than 1 trillion US dollar. And then it is predicted by like McKinsey, Moody's, SNP, PwC. If we can maintain this economic growth mathematically by 2050, our GDP will go to 7.3 trillion US dollar. We'll put Indonesia will be number four in terms of GDP in the world after China, United States, India, then Indonesia. But unfortunately, even though we are a country with a trillion GDP, uh, we still have a lot of poor people in the country. In 2015, 27 million people in the rural area in Indonesia still live under poverty line. 20,000 villages out of the 74,000 villages in Indonesia still underdeveloped villages. And this year, 60% of our labor force still only graduated from either elementary school or junior high school. And 40% still graduated from elementary school. Although in the past couple years after the reformation in 1998, we are changing from the authoritarian country to become democratic country. Thousands of trillion of money has been spent in rupiah for development of villages. But until 2015, we still have more than 20,000 villages who still underdeveloped. We still have 27 million people still under poverty line. <clears throat> the reason why? Because our business model was wrong. At that time, our business model, all the program is decided by the central government. It is impossible to understand 74,954 villages. And the President Jokowi realized the economic growth without the strong commitment of reduction, the poverty, will be the strong fuel for generating the social instability. And if that happened, the Indonesian politics become problem, then the economic growth disturb, and then the goal to be the fourth economic power in the world, probably it won't happen ever. <clears throat> so the president is committed. He committed to develop Indonesia from the rural side under his nine commitment. He realized all the poverty and, and the poor are in the rural area. <clears throat> so starting in, 19, uh, in 2015, he allocated 20.67 trillion of villages fund through at that time 74,000 villages all over Indonesia. Although we are know that they are not ready because most of the villages had only graduated from elementary school. And some of them, because the villages had is democratically elected, because probably they are head of the uh, is senior in the villages, he got elected. So some of them, even they don't have a chance to go to school. So there is a debate whether this, this work will, this model will work or not, but the president's commitment is very strong. If we don't start it now, they will never get ready. If they don't get ready, we will never start. If we never start, then we're going to make the same mistake like in the past. You know, in 2016, out of the 20.67 trillion rupiah, around 18 billion US dollar, money that distributed to the villages, only 82% that can be used. Because the rest, they don't know even how to draw down the money because there is administration work needed to draw down the money. Then we dedicated 39,000 facilitators distributed all over the villages just to help them. But the president commitment, President Jokowi commitment was very strong. 
He increased the village's fund from 20.67 trillion into 46.68 trillion rupiah. He dubbed more than double the village's fund. And he said 82% for the first year program is already good enough. We should be proud of it. And he's right. In, nine, in 2016, the absorption of villages fund, although it's double, is increased from 82% to more than 97%. Then he increased again the villages fund from 46.98 trillion rupiah, which is around 4 billion US dollar. Sorry, 4, yeah, 4 billion US dollar into 60 trillion rupiah, which is 5.3 or 5.4 billion US dollar. And the absorption or the utilization of village fund increased from 97% into more than 98%. But what amazed us in the past three years after the village fund introduced to the village, the villages can develop the infrastructure which never been happened in the Indonesian history. That's why we got the Indonesian book of record, something like that. In the past three years, the villages managed to build more than 121,000 kilometers of villages road, 971 kilometers of bridges, fisherman port, market, and then they also built like the, the wall to prevent the landslide. And the number is quite fantastic, like 65,000 units. 32 kilometers of neighborhood drainage. And then toilet. A lot of Indonesian doesn't have toilet. In the past three years, the villages fund managed to build more than 102,000 units of toilet. I was happy because we can build such much. But after we do the census, you know how many toilets needed to be built in the villages in the rural area in Indonesia? Five million. So 102,000 is nothing. So even the whole village is fun to build the toilet is not enough. So the business model is not to build the toilet, but to improve the economy of the people in the rural areas so they can build their own toilet. You know that like the wall to prevent the landslide, the number is, is like 65,000 units. Every year before in Indonesia, there are hundreds of cases of landslide. And hundreds or thousands of people get killed because of a landslide. In the past three years, only single digit case of landslide because the villages know where to beat the landslide. This won't happen if the program still using the model of centralized budget. You know. And then like the drainage, you know, every year, especially during the rainy season, during this month in Indonesia, it's rainy season during this month, Indonesia always have outbreak of dengue fever. In the past two years, we no longer have dengue fever outbreak anymore. So the village know what to do, you know. And we built like uh, a clinic in the in the villages, uh, clean water. Uh, uh, Posyandu is like is like a center for early for kid under five years and the mom, uh, how to, to, to have a best practice in raising the kid and so on, you know. And because of this, in the past three years, we managed to reduce stunting by over almost 10%, you know. But I, I, I haven't released this data because the data is still being done by the Ministry of uh, Health. I'm, I'm waiting from the data from the Indonesian Statistic Bureau because this is sampling the Indonesian Statistic Bureau using census. But normally the, the number is not far different, you know. So if this data is true, this is probably the stunting reduction, the biggest stunting reduction in Indonesian history also, you know. We managed to reduce the poor people in the village area in the past year from 27 million to 70 million, 17 million. So if we keep doing the pace in the next six years, probably there is, there is no 
poor people anymore in the villages area, you know. And we managed to reduce the Gini ratio in the villages to point, point three two, point three two, while the Gini ratio in the city is still very high, still point four oh seven, and the average national is point three nine. This number actually is alarming. That's why the president really committed how to reduce the Gini ratio, you know. As Ms. Richard said that the world, the richer is get, the rich is getting richer. In Indonesia also become political problem now because every day in the newspaper always uh, bring up the, the news that 1% of Indonesian rich people control 80% of Indonesian economy. It's, it's become politic, you know. And tomorrow is the presidential election. So this year everything has become politic in Indonesia. And then we cannot, we cannot prevent the rich from getting richer. But the, the challenge is how to make the poor not to be left behind, you know. So we have to bring Every, everybody sit together, uh, to help to build the, the villages, you know. Because now the trust is not there. The poor thing that the richer is try to squeeze the poor. The rich thing that, uh, the poor doesn't, ca cannot get along well with the rich, you know. So I got four model, you know, apart from the villages fund. Because villages fund, only 60 trillion, 60 trillion is divided by 774,954 villages is actually nothing. One village only get 800 million rupiah on average. 800 million is nothing actually. But it's good to help the villages uh, to know how to manage their money to grow their own economy. My fourth priority program, the first is Prukades. Prukades basically to develop the economic cluster in every villages. And then number two is uh, creating the water reservoir in every village using village fund. So 200 out of the 800 million of the village fund uh, ask them to meet the water reservoir because Indonesia is tropical country. Indonesia suppose can grow the grain three times a year, but unfortunately only 45% of Indonesian villages, they can plant uh, the agriculture during the dry season because simply they don't have water. So with this water reservoir, they can, so the average now is like 1.45 time in a year. So with this water reservoir, uh, they can uh, plant and harvest three times a year. And my third priority is by creating the village's own company because I, I want that the village's fund just a stimulus for a village's economic growth, but the village has to be able to to create or to get their own money to develop their own village. And the third, by creating the sport facility in the villages. Let me explain about the Prukades or the economic cluster. One of the reasons why the village is poor, because they do not focus. Because they do not focus, they don't have economic of skill. One small village, they grow paddy, they grow sugarcane, they grow all kind of commodity. There is no size. Because there is no size, it is impossible the post-harvest infrastructure is built in the villages area. And because there is no post-harvest infrastructure, the villager, they got no access for the market. Because they don't have the access for the market, most of the time, the price of their product is cheaper than the cost of the growing the product. And they become, or they consider to be the risk person in terms of doing business. So it is very difficult for them to get access from the bank loan. That's why the poor is getting poorer, or they, they, and then finally they rely on the loan shark that squeeze them, and they end up with a lot of debt. You know, so they are working just to repay the debt, you know. So with my model, I asked the head of district, 
And because the Indonesian village is too small, Indonesian village, especially in Jawa, only range from 200 to 2,000 hectare, but outside Jawa is a couple kilometers square. So with 2,000 hectare, there is economic of scale in agriculture. When we talk about agriculture, we have to talk about size, the economic of scale, because that's the nature of agriculture. Without size, without economic of scale, I don't think everybody can make money, you know, because we are talking about the volume, it's not the margin in agriculture. So I asked the head of the district to give the proposal only three focus that they can offer to me. And then with the, that proposal, I include the 19 ministry, because 19 ministry within Indonesian cabinet has a program with the villages. For instance, the Ministry of Agriculture, 100% of the program must be in the villages. It cannot be in the city, right? So the total of 19 uh, ministry program is 560 trillion rupiah, which is more than 48 billion US dollar, you know. But in the past, they are not integrated well. So they make the water dam without irrigation. They make the seaport without road, something like that. So we set the location first now. And then, you know, in Indonesia, the government only able to provide budget for development only 15%. The rest, we rely on private sector. That's why we have to involve the private sector to develop the villages, you know. So with this model, I involve the 19 ministry, the private sector, and the bank, and the head of district. This model can create common interest. The head of district, which is the politician, their benefit is just to get the food, you know. When the people income increase, they easily and cheaply get the food. Because in Indonesia, democracy is very expensive. For the people, they like it because of, of economic of scale. Their cost is cheaper because they have the, 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 the seed, the fertilizer. They don't have to go to many different layer of uh, distribution level because of economic of scale. And then their market is guaranteed because we can put the post harvest infrastructure in the particular villages. For the business community, because of the economic of scale, their interest, they can invest. And then for the bank, since this is under the closed loop economic ecosystem, you know, so the risk is not there. The bank, when there is a no risk, they will lend the money. I'll give you the example of the district of Pandeglang. District of Pandeglang is only three hours from Jakarta. But in 2015, out of the 326 villages, in that particular district. 154 district is considered underdeveloped. That's why that particular district considered underdeveloped district. I asked the head of district, which is the woman, uh, to see a couple successful district in other part of the country, you know. And then she came to me and then she committed to plant the corn 100,000 hectares. So I asked the Minister of Agriculture to do some due diligence in a particular district. Eventually, at that time, the land they ready to grow the corn only 50,000 hectare. So I invite eight minister, eight company, and four state-owned bank to sit together with the district head. And then I asked the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Minister, what do you want to support? So the Minister of Agriculture supported because Indonesia democratic country, you know, we cannot ask people to grow corn. You know. So instead of asking people, pushing people to grow, we give incentive to them so they will focus in certain commodity. You know. So the, the Minister of Agriculture, they're giving free seed, free fertilizer, and free tractor for 50,000 hectares. So people is interested to grow corn. But unfortunately, that's not enough. There are many river in that particular district. So I asked the Ministry of Public Word to help. So the Ministry of Public Word, they're helping by, by building 11 bridges in the corn plantation location. But it required 200 people, you know, to grow 50,000 hectares of corn plantation. In the past, 
they work outside of the district because there is no job in Pandeglang. So they come because there is in- incentive. But during three months until the corn is harvest, they need money to eat, right? So the state-owned minister company asked the, press, the, direct, uh, the, the state-owned bank to give credit for living, for, for living cost for three months. The bank willing to give the credit if the market is guaranteed. About two hours from Pandegelang, 50% of Indonesian feed mill is there. There are more than 12 com- feed mill is located two hours from that particular district. They consume every year 4 million ton of corn. So I asked for all of them to join the program by making building the corn dryer in the particular area. You know. And then the state-owned uh, company minister giving the incentive for the business community who built the corn dryer in the particular area. They, gave, they get the interest rate 2% less than the market. Actually, 2% is nothing, because the same money is used to give the credit for the farmer, and then for the farmer product will be bought by the village's own company, which is the same money from the same bank. And then the working capital for the off-taker company is coming also from the same bank. Actually, at least the incentive should be 5%, but we start with 2%. You know, you know last year, Pandegelang started producing the corn, uh, 90,000 ton of corn, because at that time only 20,000 hectares had been uh, ready to, to grow the corn. And it already reduced the number of underdeveloped villages from 154 to 76. And this year, Pandeglang will produce 500,000 ton of corn. And I believe this year there are no more underdeveloped villages in Pandeglang, you know. President Jokowi was loose in that particular district in 2014. Now his polling show that he win like 75% because the people are happy. You know. uh, if I have time, I can show the video of the, the, the example of Pandeglang. Kabupaten Pandeglang merupakan percontohan realisasi empat program prioritas kementerian so desa pembangunan daerah tinggal dan transmigrasi. Produk unggulan yang akan dikembangkan oleh Kabupaten Pandeglang One of the priority product that been developed in Pandeglang is corn, and then Pandeglang menargetkan 51 ribu hektar tanaman jagung dan telah terrealisasi kurang this, lebih this, sebanyak 20.000 hektar. video was built in July last year. So they just produce 20,000 hektar at the time. But now already 50,000 hektar. Bulan September 2017, Kabupaten Pandeglang berhasil panen jagung sekitar 29.000 ton. In July they already have 29,000 ton. Pandeglang in December 90,000 ton. And this year it is predicted 500,000 ton. ton. In with 500,000 ton, the Pandeglang can have income of 1.5 trillion rupiah. What is 1.5 trillion rupiah mean for Pandeglang? The, the budget or the income for the particular district only 180 billion. See, almost 10 times from the income of that particular district. Cikedal, Kabupaten Pandeglang. And then every villages in, in that particular district, they already have the villages own company. And every villages own company, I give like EDC, the electronic data center from the bank, from the state owned bank. So it become like the bank. So the bank doesn't need to have to open the brands, just give the EDC. And with the EDC, the people can get the money from the bank, can transfer the money, can get all the bank facilities from just warti- one particular EDC. In the past, before before we implement this, if the villages people want to go to bank, they have to hire the motorbike taxi. It costs like 30000 Now, no more. They just, within walking distance, they can go to the villages on company. Subur di desa Bengkuyung ini menjadi emping melinjau. 
sekitar 300 orang ibu rumah tangga okay. dapat tambah. And then I'll show you one more example. I make a model in the very extreme environment in Sumba Timur, where the the area only have water three months out of a year because it's limestone. Yeah, the rest of the month even the the river is dry, and it's very difficult to grow agriculture in the particular area. Show it the movie. I asked the district head to sit together with the one of Indonesian richest conglomerate, which is Jarum. Jarum is the Indonesian richest to build the sugarcane plantation. I give 10,000 hectare of land to the people. Every family got three hectare. And with this model, they can earn 85 million a year, which is 7 million a month. 7 million a month is like $500 a month. You see, this is the, the area, you know, how you grow agriculture in this area. So we do the cut and fill without government money. It's private sector money in the people land. With this business model, the payback period is like seven to eight years. So we have to build the water tendon, you know, the water tendon, because there is no water practically in the particular area. Every water tendon is 100 by 100 by 12 meter. It costs about 10 billion rupiah, almost a million US dollar. So we already built 22 water tendon like this to water the sugarcane plantation. You know, we, we, we even have to put two layer of membrane because the tendon can hold the water without, without the uh, geomembrane. You see now it's green and you don't see any irrigation in it. Because we cannot use the conventional irrigation because the water cannot, I mean the land cannot hold the water. So we use the membrane pipe underneath every sugarcane plant. We get the technology from Israel. So by 2019, it can produce 150,000 ton of sugar in this particular area. So if we can do this particular extreme area, we can do the rest. Show it again in Islam. Indonesia used to be the biggest producer of shrimp. For some reason, there is a social unrest. And the shrimp pond, which is four times as big as Singapore, stopped the operation. The farmer end up with a 1.2 trillion debt. 23,000 farmer, you know. So the company cannot grow. The farmer cannot grow, but the infrastructure is already there. So I help the company to have a restructuring with the creditor. And then after that, the company pardon 1.2 trillion debt of the farmer. So the farmer become debt free. They give back the land title, 9,500 land title as the collateral. So with that, I can give the loan again to the farmer and the shrimp pond started again. But the problem, the electricity is not there. But the state-owned ministry committed to, state-owned company minister committed to me by the end of the year, the electricity will come back. And I will add the, the, the loan to the farmer to 1.2 trillion again. And by then, I believe Indonesia will be the biggest stream exporter in the world again. So with this model, the farmer can earn between 60 to 200 million rupiah a year. So between 5 million to like 15 million a month, or between 500 to 1500 uh, US dollar. Sorry. Apa yang dilakukan dan pendekatan yeah, 500 to, yang to 1500 uh, US dollar a month. memiliki potensi yang besar untuk dikembangkan. So my dream if in 2016, when I introduced this model, yeah, I, I make a roadshow in 44 district, only 22 willing to join because there is no showcase. And luckily, out of the 22 district 
who is join my program, 19 district head get elected cheaply. Because the income of the people increase, so the people uh, appreciate the work of the district head, so they get re-elected again. This year, I open 40 slot and 168 district register. Only 122 that, 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 that pass the requirement. So I connect them with 68 company to make 200 uh, uh, business uh, collaboration in the 128 district and there is investment of 47 trillion rupiah. 47 trillion is around 4 billion US dollar in that particular uh, co collaboration. All of all over the 122 district. My dream, if this is become national program, if every labor force in the villages can earn just two million, because my model, it can earn more than five million. If just two million, Indonesia now has 131 million uh, labor force, and by the next 10 year, Indonesian labor force will increase to 200 million because we got demographic bonus. Our labor force will increase from 47% to 67% within the next seven years. And half of it, they are living in the rural area, in the villages. So the villages have, will have 100 million labor force. If 100 million labor force can earn just 2 million, 2 million is less than $200 a month. So the villages can earn more than 200 trillion a month. Because they cannot save, so it create the consumption power at least five times. So the villages will have consumption power of a thousand trillion a month, or twelve thousand trillion rupiah a year. Is equal to one trillion US dollar GDP, the same as Indonesian GDP now. So I expect with this model, in the next seven year, the villages can contribute one trillion US dollar GDP. For the currently by then Indonesian GDP is already 2.3 uh, trillion US dollar. So that's about all that I can share to you. So, but we all talk about equal inequality. We all talk about the gender. We all talk about the education. But the, that is only the result of the root cause. In Indonesia, one of the root cause is the quality of the bureaucracy. We are a country with 22,000 trillion or 200 billion. Yes, 22,000 trillion is like divided by 10,000 is like how much? Two hundred trillion US dollar, you know. Sorry, no, no, it's not 200 trillion. But it's big. <laughs> it's big. You know, we still have problem with corruption. We still have problem of what, the understanding of the program, the paradigm of the bureau. I never, I never, never run in public office before. I was so shocked when I run the public office. I never asked the president before I, I'm inaugurated as the minister, seven days after I was inaugurated as the minister, I asked the president, Mr. President, why you put me as the villages, the minister of villages, disadvantages, regions, and transmigration? First of all, I never run the public office. Second of all, I'm not from the villages. I never go to the villages before. So the president told me, Mr. Minister, this is a new ministry, and the management was lousy at that time. So you, as a CEO, I want you to, to do something for the organization, because this is a new organization. Second of all, you've been running a commodity company more than 20 years. And 90% of Indonesian villages rely on commodity, rely on agriculture. If I ask the villager to be the minister of village, they see the problem every day. They won't see the problem as a problem. So you go to the villages, make a breakthrough. That's why I make a breakthrough. So 
you know, running the organization, the first of all, you have to know the objective first. And then you have to create the business model that suits with the objective. And then man, method, machine, money, that's an old thought that we learned for hundreds of years, right? So I hired a consultant just to make sure the organization within our ministry is right. And turn out it's not right. So I fire more than a thousand bureaucracy within one year. I fire six director general, 18 director, 300 echelon three. Because what supposed to be common sense is not happen to be a common practice. It doesn't make sense to me. The ministry, the government minister, the spending of just spending the budget, yeah, because we are in the private sector. In order to grow, we have to think about how to raise money also, right? This is just spending budget. We can only be able to spend 65%. Just spending the budget. So after the, the restructuring of the organization, the spending of the budget, my ministry rank is jumped from rank 65 to rank 15. The back office administration is improved from the rank 84 to rank 6. The public service improved from rank 86 to rank 6. Our audit opinion is improved from qualified to unqualified. And we got uh, two Indonesian record for building the infrastructure and 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 at the end of the day, they do, the bureaucracy, the one who run the organization. That's why, you know, in Indonesia, we got the, the body that can control, can see the, the movement of the money. So I'm a minister, can ask the data for my staff, the family of the staff, and the closest friend of the staff. If that data is flop, then forget it. I just and then I open the auction for everybody to be everything because in the past the organization is strong, the senior level is so strong, so the young generation cannot go to the top. So everybody can make a proposal. I make a panel consists of the bureaucracy, consists of the academician, consists of Indonesian intelligence, consists of so if. If they pass the, the test, the three best, I give it to the user to select which one of them. Because the chemistry is very important. Because in the past, I noticed that some of the director general afraid to the director because the director have the backing of somebody. Some of the director afraid to the S3 because the S3. That's not organization, you know. So you have to start first thing first with the bureaucracy first. Otherwise, no matter how good is your model, it won't work. The second of thing, some of good model won't work because the people is not ready. So you need to have a persistent. You need to have a political commitment. You know, I'm lucky. I'm having the boss, which is my president. The commitment is very strong in development of the village, and he keep increasing. And the village is fun. Uh, next year will be increased to 80 trillion rupiah. We start from 20 trillion rupiah. And he asked uh, six ministry to have a program, a dedicated some program to support my program, more than 100 trillion rupiah. So hopefully with this model, uh, we can reduce the poverty. And when people income in increase, their concern to the equality become more and more, the education become better and better, and hopefully democracy, the quality of democracy become better and better. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now we'll move to Professor Ravayan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, great. And thank you very much to IFAD for inviting me, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us, and in thanking them for organizing this important and interesting conference. Um, uh, this is going to be a change of, of tack. Um, 
I'm going to take a broad perspective on the topic of the conference. I'm going to begin with uh, some stylized facts about poverty and inequality in the world. Um, things you may know and things you may not know, because a lot of the stylized facts are um, not so obvious when you dig a bit deeper. Uh, that'll be my first topic, and then I'm going to turn to the questions of this conference, as, as I perceive them. I've taken these pretty much from the information if it is provided. Okay, the stylized facts. I think we we all know there's been this huge reduction in in um, global relative inequality. Actually, maybe we don't know that. Do you realize global relative inequality has been falling markedly the last few decades? But what is global relative inequality here? It's put all the people in the world together, ignore what countries they live in, and calculate relative inequality, depending on the ratios of incomes or consumptions, amongst all those people. Well, I guess that's good news, but actually dig a bit deeper, things aren't such good news. Um, this drawing, uh, the graph on the right here, gives you... Let's see if I can get this to work. Oops, well, that didn't do very good. No. Um, the top line on this graph is, is what I just told you, glo total global inequality relative inequality in the world, inequality amongst all world citizens ignoring where they live. Next line down is inequality between countries, basically tracking global inequality. So the thing that's driving down global inequality is inequality between countries. So what's driving down inequality between countries? Higher growth rates in poorer countries. We've seen a huge change, particularly accelerating since 2000, a doubling of the per capita growth rate in private consumption per person in the developing world doubling. This is a huge success. And the minister from Indonesia has just talked about some examples re relevant to that success. But look at that line at the bottom there. That's average inequality amongst all, uh, within countries. So let's think of that, that as just taking a, a population weighted average of all the inequality within countries and track that over time. That's what's creeping upwards. But a lot of the concern about inequality is that red line down the bottom there. What's happening to global poverty? I think you know the, the blue line here. This is a count of the number of people living below the World Bank's international poverty line over time. Uh, and it's, you know, it's going in the right direction. This is fantastic. This is great news. Um, but again, look a bit clo more closely at the data. There are a couple of things that aren't so, so compelling. Uh, one is that red line. This is my count of the number of people who are living in poverty by the standards of the country they live in. Not by the World Bank's global international standard, which I think is hugely important, obviously I think that. Um, but you've got to look at the picture from different, look at the story from different angles here, because you, otherwise you don't understand what's going on in the world. Um, we're not making nearly as much progress in reducing the number of people who are poor by the standards typical of the country they live in. Not this global standard, the standard of the country they live in. We can call that relative poverty, if you like. We're seeing much less progress. Uh, some, uh, that's great too, um, global relative poverty is, is falling, but very slowly. What about this expression we hear a lot, leave, don't, let's not leave the poorest behind, the last mile, um, expression if had uses often. Every agency, including the Vatican, um, talks about leaving no one behind now. Well, we are. This picture tells that story, looks at exactly the same data in a different way. What I've plotted here on the vertical axis is the absolute income gain over that same time period, a 30-year period, the absolute dollar per day income gain over time. Uh, by, by, sorry, by, by percentiles. So what do we see in this picture? Cast your eye to the far left. That's about zero. In other words, the poorest percentile in the world is not much better off now than 30 years ago. Look, you cast your eye to the top, there we, where we're seeing a lot of gains. These are absolute gains by percentile, and they're... They're large, but they're large for the not-so-poor. And in fact, this is perfectly consistent with declining numbers of, of poverty. What's happening in the world is we're reducing the numbers of people 
living near the bottom, but we're not raising the floor, lifting the bottom. It's still roughly at the biological level. Now, the floor, the lower bound of the distribution of income in the world, is not necessarily at the biological level. It's well above the biological level in this country and most of the rich countries in the world. Well above. In America and the United States, the floor is about $6 a day. The biological level is about a dollar a day, a bit lower. Depends on which year's prices you're talking about. So countries can lift the floor well above the biological level, but the developing world as a whole is not doing that very well. And it's not doing that nearly as well as the rich world was doing when it had all its success against absolute poverty. You go back 200 years, the rich world today was just as poor as, as sub-Saharan Africa today. The lifting that was done was not just reducing numbers of poor people, it was raising the floor as well. And I'd argue that the difference is largely to do with the efficacy of social policy, which I'm going to come back to. This is what the picture looks like. This picture is developing world as a whole. This version is world, world as a whole. Ah, <laughs> look at that. We're still down the bottom near zero on the far left. It's you know clocking up a little bit, and a little bit of progress, and then it's shooting right up at the top. In fact, we don't really know how high it is at the top. Okay, some stylized facts about rural. This is putting a, a big picture and background to everything we're going to be talking about, I hope. Some stylized facts about rural inequality. A number of things here. We know um, uh, poverty rates are high in rural areas. That's still true. Two-thirds to 70% of the world's absolutely poor live in rural areas, and, uh, and that's still true. Human development indicators worse in rural areas. Public service provision tends to be worse. Um, also, inequality, income inequality tends to be lower in rural areas than urban areas. There are some exceptions. Or China's a big exception to this, but most developing countries, income inequality is low in rural areas and urban areas. This was actually one of the style facts of Simon Kuznets's famous paper in the mid-1950s. Um, signs of convergence between urban and rural areas. We're making more progress, roughly, against rural poverty than urban poverty. And that's natural, in a sense, because part of the progress we make is by moving people from rural areas to urban areas. And that slows down this pace of urban poverty reduction. Quite naturally. It's not, that's not a bad thing. Uh, it can be a, a, a troubling thing for cities dealing with a, a, an urban poverty problem, but looking at the picture as a whole, it's a part of a process of labour absorption from agriculture, of economic development more broadly. Um, economic development can be good or bad for inequality. It's roughly a, a split decision. Half the time is good, half the time is bad. The reasons are many. They're to do with policies and initial conditions. Okay, those are the stylized facts. Questions for this conference. As I, I see it, this is uh, almost word for word, uh, do policies uh, to reduce rural in, uh, poverty also reduce the rural inequality? Second question, a little bit more challenging, should we care if the answer is no? First point, there are two drivers of rural poverty reduction, agriculture and rural development and urbanization. Different degrees, different importance, and I'll mention China in more detail later, but China and, and uh, India are both examples I'll, I'll come back to, but big examples. Um, both of these drivers have, na have naturally ambiguous implications for, for inequality within countries and inequality within rural areas. Ambiguous meaning Agriculture and rural development can, be, can increase rural inequality, can decrease rural inequality. D avoid generalizations on this. You've got to look at the country cir sp specific circumstances. As the Minister for Indonesia pointed out, I think you've got to implicitly point it out, I think you've got to go even sub-national. You've got to look at the circumstances in villages, circumstances in specific places to get to understand this relationship. Avoid these broad generalizations. They don't help. Uh, urbanization. Urbanization helps reduce poverty through migration, through labor absorption from rural areas, through trade and common markets, particularly labor. Labor markets are poorly integrated in some places, better integrated in others. Indonesia is a case where they're relatively well integrated, but other countries in, in India, they're, they're poorly integrated, becoming more integrated, and that transmission mechanism can be strong or weak, depending on the circumstances. Should policymakers care 
about rural inequality. Well, I'm going to sit on the fence here. Maybe no. Maybe, maybe yes. Maybe no. Um, one thing I would I would really encourage you to avoid. I suspect this is a selected audience, so it's probably not necessary. But one thing I encourage you to avoid is is saying things like um, uh, poverty reduction trumps inequality. We don't worry about um, inequality if we're seeing falling poverty. Uh, I think that's a dangerous way of thinking because it's too simple a model. Many of the things that many of the ways in which inequality matters are dynamic. They're about growth processes, the nature of the growth process in a country, and ultimately about how fast you reduce poverty. So the danger in that thinking is is to do with the it's too static a view. A poverty reducing and growth promoting development path could well increase rural inequality. Again, it's highly contingent on the specific circumstances. Um, sorry, I missed this. Um, a further point, another reason why this question is, in a sense, the wrong question, is um, we need to unpack inequality. Now, I, I've talked about income inequality and consumption inequality. Obviously, there are many dimensions of inequality. We, we know that, and this is just one of them. Uh, but the unpacking is actually crucial to the position one takes in this question. Whether you care about rural inequality depends on the source of the rising inequality. There are good and bad inequalities. Some growth processes generate inequality in ways which are highly poverty-reducing, promote human development. Other growth processes can do the exact opposite. Um, we need to be cautious and we need to think about what it is about inequality. That's also how we build a social consensus for action. Um, I had a, an op-ed in Le Monde a few months ago on this topic. How do we build that social consensus? We have a social consensus for reducing poverty. I don't think anybody's going to say we shouldn't eliminate poverty. Who will say that? Nobody in this room, but I don't think anybody will say that. Maybe in private, um, some begrudging, awful person, but okay. Typically, that's not going to happen. But in equality, we don't have that social consensus. And building that consensus around action is crucial. I, I'm a researcher and I'm not an activist, but I also understand that the importance of, um, of building that consensus. I don't think we're going to do it by un without unpacking inequality and talking about the specific aspects that would really matter. And those are aspects around, I would argue, uh, how it impacts on poverty and growth in the longer term is an important one. And also inequality of opportunity is important. I think we can build a consensus around that. In the, con in the context of this conference, that's going to be around, about enhancing access to urban opportunities by poor rural people. That's going to be first order issue. There are also specific inequalities that are important here that have much more weight in policy dialogue and building that social consensus than they do in, in, typically in the numbers we use. The specific inequalities I'm referring to are about gender, race, ethnicity, and in Indian context, caste. Country stories. I just thought I'd really summarize these stories. I have a 700-page book that came out two years ago that this is a, really a summary of and talks a lot about this. Um, China... People don't realize how, much, how important agriculture and rural development was to the Chinese success story. And it's a huge success story. No country in human history has been as, has, as successful as China has been against absolute poverty. Agriculture and rural development has been crucial to that process. People think it was all driven by manufactured-led, export-led growth. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was part of the story, by all means. But the big kid on the block here, and starting with Deng Xiaoping's agrarian reforms starting in 1978, was agriculture and rural development. Making markets work better for poor people was what it was partly about, and, and um, reforming the household responsibility system, privatizing access to land, uh, moving away from a failed socialist agricultural system to something that actually worked. Um, these are important things, but also equally well, the, China benefited from initial conditions to do with the access to land, inequality in access to land, and also inequality in human uh, capital and access to health and education. Those inequalities were relatively low, much lower, for example, than India was at the time India started its reforms um, in the early 1990s. Um, those were legacies of socialism in many ways, but also legacies of Deng Xiaoping's reforms. And when you privatize the land under the House Responsibility System, uh, obviously you, you're not going to be, create much inequality. You're going to give relatively equal access within communes, and that's what happened. That people don't realize that reform was one of the largest land reforms in human history. And land reform, when you can do it, 
equalizing the distribution of land, when you can do it, is hugely powerful in terms of the growth process going forward, both within agriculture and within the urban economy. India's story is very different. The inequality of land in India is so great, so much greater than compared to, to China. Large point mass of landless people in rural areas. And naturally then, agriculture has been relatively less important. In fact, services have been doing much more work than agriculture in, in, in India. But agriculture is actually still, until the early, until about early 1990s, agriculture and rural development was still more important than urban economic development. Urban economic development was leaving the poor behind in India. That process that has changed fundamentally. Um, the urban growth processes we're seeing in the last couple of decades have been more pro-poor and more labour-absorbing. Um, prior to the reforms, the growth process was reducing poverty in urban areas, but not doing much for rural areas. Now it's helping in both by absorption of labour from rural areas. Um, how much of this is the reforms versus the big construction boom going on in India? We don't know. I, I hope a lot of big chunk of it is the reform process, but I'm also suspicious that a large chunk is construction boom, and I'm not sure how sustainable that will be, but that's a question going forward. Um, broader picture, that's just two countries, broader picture, economic growth has been dri driving glo global absolute poverty reduction, there's no doubt about that. Um, that's not a, you know, that's not saying much, that's just saying, another way of saying that is redistribution has largely failed. Growth has been doing most of the work. Um, but again, we need to go a little bit deeper into the story to understand what's going on here, because it's not a simple matter of growth being the exogenous driver of poverty reduction. If anything, poverty reduction is also a driver of growth. There's a two-equation model here, not a one-equation model. We need to think of both of these things simultaneously. No good economist should ever think of distribution as something exogenous to economics. It is fundamental to everything that happens in an economy. Um, poor countries have a harder time growing their economies, and poor countries have a harder time assuring um, that, the, the, that growth will be sustained and that it will be pro-poor. There's a huge handicap for economic development from poverty. Uninsured risks are a continuing concern. Um, I see a lot, of this in the, a lot of this in the conference, and there's going to be both macro and micro perspectives. I think much more micro perspectives in this conference, but the macro perspective is hugely important. So how do we assure rapid poverty reduction? Um, Pro-poor growth is going to be, continue to be important, there's no question, but I think we've also got to look at the complementarities between pro-poor growth processes in economies and social policy, which I, I promise to come back to. Because those comp that complementarity is hugely important. There's a strong positive interaction effect between the, our success in social policy and our success in pro-growth economic reform. Those, social, those interaction effects, you can have a little bit of impact from a, pro a, a, a growth-promoting, market-friendly economic reform, but if you combine it with progressive social policy, you can have a huge impact. We also need a bit of good luck going forward. And there's some bad luck <laughs> happening in the world um, in some countries. I happen to live in the United States. I'm Australian, but I live in the United States. But there's some bad luck happening there. And, and bad luck here could include um, a, a global trade war, a retreat from, from global trade. Um, while I'm a bit of an agnostic on the importance of trade for poverty reduction, inequality reduction, sometimes yes, sometimes no, again, it depends. I'm pretty sure a global trade war is not going to be good for the world's poor. How do we achieve more pro-poor growth? I've listed my favourite set of things, and nearly finished here, but my favourite set of things, develop human and physical assets of poor people, make markets work better for poor people. A lot of reforms are, are making markets work better, but not for poor people. They're ignoring them. Making markets work better, looking at the problems in land, labour, credit markets, from the perspective of poor people, and working on reforms, Reform's a nice word, but it can be mean, it means stuff that isn't terribly important. Focus on reforms that really do matter to poor people. Promoting agriculture and rural development will continue to be important. Intelligent investment in local public goods in poor areas. And again, the Minister of Indonesia gave, gave some compelling examples. Uh, remove restrictions on migration. There are plenty of them. I mean, the first one, I don't know, probably argue a first order issue for global poverty reduction is the hukou system in China. Uh, restrictions on migration that really do hurt poor people and are, and are really hard to, to, uh, to get rid of. 
Um, but the restrictions of migration in various forms, much more subtle than the HUCO system, the internal passport system in China, much more subtle in, in many countries. Um, foster labor absorption to urban economies, small and medium-sized towns have a hugely important role, much more important, I would argue, at least from my research in India, much more important than big cities. Um, a new role for redistributed interventions. Yes, this is my last substantive slide. Um, I think this is, this is true. We, we, we need to think about this in, uh, going forward, but we also need to think about the challenges. And I emphasize a number of them here. Information is a huge challenge. Uh, I've been working uh, with um, Dominic van der Waal and Kate Brown on a series of papers on the importance of information constraints in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, across 30 countries now. Uh, and the information constraints, what do governments know, are hugely important. And economists don't give them enough attention. Uh, it's not as sexy as incentives and political economy, but just that simple thing. What do governments know reliably? And what, what, if, what should you do given that information, not some idealized information you may imagine a policymaker having, uh, is hugely important. Um, excessive emphasis on fine targeting. We've got to get this, I've been, I've been saying this my entire career, 25 years in the World Bank with limited success, I'm sorry to say. Um, get, stop thinking about targeting poor people as the objective. It is not. Poverty reduction is the objective. Given the limited information, given the incentive constraints, targeting is maybe important, maybe not. Keep it on the menu of policies, of options, or by all means, but don't get obsessed with it. Because uh, I fear it, that obsession is often implicitly or, or explicitly an effort to cut funding of social policy. Uh, protection and promotion, a role for smart social policies, and I think we're going to continue in this direction. Um, I'm not sure what will happen with the conditionalities that are being were very popular. I think they're a little bit overstated and they impose costs on poor people that we do have to take account of seriously. But a whole set of potentially smart social policies going forward. And finally, monitoring and evaluation is going to be key. Uh, here, the one message that I, I keep emphasizing is there's no one way to evaluate stuff. There's no one way to learn about what works in, in development. And the idea that we can solve all of these problems with something like a randomized control trial, a set of random RCTs, is really a, a non-starter in my view. It's one of the things that matters, but it's only one of the things. It's one tool you may use. But use it. Um, don't uh, don't start with a methodology. Start with a question. Start with a, a policies you want to evaluate, and look at the best way to do that going forward. No one evaluation method dominates. And finally, learn from both successes and failures. Um, this sounds sort of mundane. Why would anybody say such an obvious thing? Actually, <laughs> um, governments, in my experience, and I've had a lot of experience working with governments. Governments are really are happy to hear about successes. And they will encourage successful policy, but I have a, have a hard time often getting them to downgrade or move away from a failed policy based on evaluation. We, there's an asymmetry there that is very worrying going forward. Um, there's an NGO, uh, um, Give Well, I think it's called, that has a website uh, with, with a page on that website devoted to its failures. One of those failures, by the way, it was actually top of the list, was not hiring early enough a PhD economist to help them evaluate stuff. That's right. Um, but but um, the lesson is clear. I wish governments would do the same. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you see, we're behind schedule. I didn't manage the time well, uh, so we won't have time for a Q&A. Um, while uh, Joanne will come up to, uh, to say what's next, let me just make a couple comments. Um, the title of this was What's Needed to Reduce Rural Poverty and How Can We Measure Its Achievement? It might have been better to title it How Can We Manage Its Achievement? Uh, one of the striking things that uh, the minister said was, to know your objective first and create a business model to meet that objective, right? So know your objective first and to create a business model to, to achieve that objective. And then Professor Vervalian also said, you know, stop, stop thinking about targeting as objective, but focus on poverty reduction. And he showed us those great numbers of, well, not great numbers, terrible numbers, but uh, numbers that we need to see about uh, the income gains among the poorest population. So it makes it very clear what the objective is. 
uh, and we have to figure out how to manage towards that objective. Uh, so I, I think we should, it, it, it won't, won't manage the time, I don't think, so. Uh, Joanne? Thanks very much. I think, uh, Paul, you've summed up summed up very well some really good examples of, of how po poverty, uh, inequality can be addressed, but also some uh, caveats of no size fits, fits all. Um, and I think um, we've really started with the, um, what Oscar called on us to be provocative, the provocative question of should we really care about reducing inequality, and I do hope everyone in this room agrees that we should care and uh, take that question moving forward. I just want to um, run through what's going to happen next. Before breaking out for session one and two, take a look at your program where you'll see some information about these uh, breakout groups. They occur in two different venues. One is this room, which is the Italian um, conference room, and then there's the oval room across the hall. You'll find a poster outside every room to guide you on what session's happening where, and uh, inf all the information about the topic and the presenters are in your program. There's no coffee break indicated, but you'll find coffee outside all the time, so go and help yourself in the open space. You'll see that we're running a little bit late, so we'll start lunch a little bit, a little bit late and have a bit of a shorter lunch break. Um, but before we move on to that, let me just talk to you a bit about a, a, a different way of taking questions that we're going to do in this room for the coming sessions. We're going to use an online interactive question platform called Mentimeter, which will be in addition to traditional questions with the roaming microphone. So how does it work? Can, can we just bring it up on the screens here? Um, this will give you a chance to ask your questions if you don't have a chance to voice it, or maybe during the presentations you have a question that you don't want to forget about. First, you'll have to connect to, you, to the internet on your phones. You'll find on your seats a blue card showing you how to connect to the Wi-Fi here. You'll open up your uh, web browser on your phone. Is it possible to bring this up on the screen here? Okay, I'll talk you through it as we go. Um, you'll type in www.menti.com. There we go. And you'll see a code on the right-hand side here, on the, my right, your left. So if you go to www.menti.com, you'll insert that code, and then you'll be able to type in your question. If you have any trouble connecting or remembering how to do this, please ask the messengers. Your questions will come up on the screen, and we'll all be able to, to see them. They will be anonymous, though, so be provocative. Ask what you want. And then the panelists and the moderators can draw on those questions as, as it continues. So, sorry, I've got too many papers here. Let me just also mention, I saw a lot of you were taking, taking rapid notes during these two presentations. If you want any of the supporting documents provided by the speakers, there are a limited supply available outside the conference rooms. You can also find them online on the conference website, www.efad.org forward slash web forward slash events forward slash rural dash inequalities, which you'll never remember. So if you want to find it, please also ask the messengers to take that down. You can also ask the messengers for a USB key with all the supporting documents on and, any, and it also has additional information. So I mentioned that the lunch will be a little bit late, but it will be a light stand-up lunch, which will be served on both days in an area called, by the executive dining room. There will be signs, so just follow the crowd out there. And we're going to resume in plenary here at 2.30 p.m. to talk about how to promote growth and reduce inequalities, what actions are required and by whom. So now it's time for our first round of breakout sessions, which will focus on the first of the R's, resources. What resources need, need to be redistributed, to what extent and how. Please choose your room and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you.